Arun Majumdar and I would like to welcome you back to the Stanford Global Energy Dialogue series. We are, of course, living in extraordinary times. And to understand this unique moment in history through the lens of energy, we at Stanford have started a series of conversations about the future of energy. Two weeks ago, we held our first such dialogue with the 13th US Secretary of Energy, Dr. Ernest Moniz. We had a rich discussion about how investments in clean energy would help not only address the current economic crisis, but to also accelerate climate change solutions. Today, we have the pleasure of welcoming the 12th US Secretary of Energy, Stephen Chu. Dr. Chu is the William R. Keenan Professor of Physics and of Molecular and Cellular Physiology at Stanford University. As the first scientist to ever hold a cabinet position in the US, he is the longest serving Secretary of Energy from 2009 to 2013. Dr. Chu is currently the president-elect of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He is the co-recipient of the 1997 Nobel Prize in Physics for his contributions in laser cooling and atom trapping. And he continues to do research in his laboratory working on ultrasound and optical biomedical imaging, electrochemical systems such as batteries and electrolyzers, as well as energy storage in general. Today, we will have a two-part dialogue. The first part will focus on using investments in clean energy to stimulate the economy. Dr. Chu has a unique perspective on this topic since as Secretary of Energy, he had to execute on the 2009 American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, which was created to stimulate an economic recovery from the Great Recession. This involved a $35.2 uh, $35 billion investment in clean energy. And we'll get into this in some detail. The second part of the dialogue will involve a presentation by Dr. Chu about energy storage, particularly long duration, cost-effective storage for the grid, which, means, which remains a significant challenge for deep renewables adoption. After the presentation, we will open this up to Q&A with the audience and integrate some student questions as well. Arun, uh, let's go ahead and get going. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sally um, and, and Steve. Uh, welcome to this dialogue. Before we get started with the Q&A, um, we like to offer a quiz and a poll uh, just to get you, the audience, all warmed up. So the question is the following. Roughly how many terawatt hours of electricity did the U.S. consume in 2019? 1,000, 4,000, 7,000, or 10,000? And you have 15 seconds to answer this, and we will display the results of so what you... So the, the majority of the people said um, 7,000 terawatt hours, 54%, 5% uh, said uh, uh, 1,000, 15%, 4,000. You can see the results. The actual answer is 4,000 terawatt hours of electricity was consumed by the United States in 2019. Um, so that's the 15% of the people got that right. Okay, so let's get started. So um, first we'll talk about the Recovery Act. And, and Steve, as you know, we are in a, um, uh, an economic crisis, a global economic crisis, which is larger than the financial crisis that we had in 2009. And at that time, the, the Recovery Act was, uh, was passed and you, you were involved in executing. In fact, you were, you were leading the effort in the Department of Energy. And so let me just quickly recap what we saw, because it was a watershed moment for the energy sector uh, in the United States. Uh, I'll divide it into two parts. One is the deployment part, and the other is the research part. We saw in the deployment part doubling of renewable energy in the United States. Uh, just to give you a few examples, the first Tesla plant, plant was built with the help of a DOE loan, which was returned with interest ahead of schedule. There were 4,000, uh, or sorry, there were 15 million smart meters that were installed in homes and buildings. 650,000 low-income homes were weatherized, and many, many more. From the R&D point of view, under your leadership, we saw the first budget and the launch of RPE. 
the energy innovation hubs, which were really uh, your idea, your vision because of your experience in Bell Labs, there was a massive increase in energy frontier research centers because these were started under Secretary Bodman, and then you came in and you doubled down using Recovery Act. They were doubling down at the bioenergy research centers, which were really the precursor for the energy hubs, and then the Sunshot Initiative, and there are many more. So again, this was a watershed moment in the US energy sector, um, and both for deployment and innovation. It's been 10 years. When you step back from this, what are your lessons learned from what went well? What did not go well? What should we repeat? What are your top three lessons learned from that experience? Okay, thank you, Arun. Can you, can you all hear me? Yes? Good. Um, all right, so I, 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 would, I suppose that the, um, there were some things that went well. One of the things that went well, for example, is some of the research institutions we started, RPE, which grew out of Rising Above the Gathering Storm, a report that was written in 2005, where we specifically recommended that because energy, clean energy is so important in the 21st century, that a new uh, funding agency should be formed. And it was formed with, again, a mentality of Bell Labs. The way Bell Labs parsed out money is that there wasn't really a peer review, it was a superior review. Your department head, your director, uh, would talk to the person proposing the experiment and just decide on the spot, could take a few days, but very quickly, whether this was worthwhile. Those people were intimately involved in knowing what was going to happen. And so, we thought in 2005 and six that if we could get outstanding people to administer this program, scientists and engineers who were as good or better than you normally find uh, in the applicant pool, uh, you'd have the best chance of success. And uh, I think that worked in the sense that if you look at the people who worked at RPE, certainly in the first two or three rounds, including Aruma Jamber, the first director, uh, it was unlike anything the department saw before or since, in the sense that many, many people came in who would never have thought of working in the government and worked long hours. Um, 60 hour work weeks were not unusual at all uh, because they were the type of person in the private sector, typically in universities, but some industries, who would also be working, loving what they did, dedicated to what they were doing and uh, quickly drew the respect of the uh, applicant pool. And when they got funding, uh, I had several people come up to me and said, where did you find these people? They're helping solve our technical problems and we're formulating better business people. Usually they just give you money and they ask for a lot of paperwork and that's all we see of them. So things like that worked very, very well. Sunshot, as you mentioned, uh, which wasn't a new program, it was a revitalized program out of uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency part of the Department of Energy, also founded on the same principles, got similar like-minded individuals. And so you couldn't tell the difference in the ethic between uh, something like Sunshot and, and RPE. Those things worked very well, mostly because of the quality of the people. That meant the decision-making and who to fund and to help the people who got funded, rather than just say, give me more paperwork, um, was something I think we can look back and say, that was something that really went well. Um, another thing that, although heavily criticized, that went well, was believe it or not, the loan program. The loan program, the loan guarantee program, uh, without it, Tesla would not have survived. It would have by the time they got our loan, they were within one month of, um, wouldn't even say chapter 11, probably chapter seven, sell all the parts. Um, and, uh, and yet it still remains uh, a pioneering company in electric vehicles and has really, it's safe to say, set the standard of what high-end electric vehicles can be and how attractive they, they can be. Uh, and as, it, as time goes on, they're working towards uh, bringing their products down more towards the average household where the average car price is not $50,000, but um, more like 20. 
thousand dollars. Uh, but this is something that worked very well. We also gave large loans to Ford, uh, would not have survived without that, and Nissan to build a leaf in America. And so these are things that actually work. The thing that worked even better were our large loans to solar and wind farms. Before, our, before the Recovery Act, before um, 2009, there were no solar farms at 100 megawatts. And the first five solar farms of greater than 100 megawatts was actually uh, financially engineered by the Department of Energy, uh, working in cohort with banks, uh, uh, Chase, Citibank, people like that. Uh, we were able to lo issue loans, loan guarantees, meaning if all goes well, the project is built on time, on budget, uh, all the customers had what are called offtake agreements. And so the contract would be you buy our electricity at a certain rate for, let's say, 20 years or so. Uh, virtually all of those projects did come in on budget, on time, and uh, are making money. We were only able to charge very, very low interest, uh, 200 basis points above Treasury, but it worked. But what really worked was before that, Wall Street would not touch large solar wind farms. They considered it too risky to invest hundreds of millions of dollars on these uh, large installations. And since that time, now, nowadays, Wall Street considers investing wind farms and solar farms probably a better investment today than investing in oil companies. So times have really changed. So this loan program actually got the very large wind farms and solar farms started. And you can see uh, in our history, both wind and solar took a market jump upward. But the most important thing is that it showed you can build these very large farms and keep on time on budget. And it got the finance community uh, to say, these are good investments. Uh, you mentioned the hubs, uh, th things of that nature. That also worked well. Um, it's hard to say because there's no controlled experiment if these things did not exist. Uh, had something happened faster or better that, that we had these uh, energy innovation hubs versus did we not have them? Uh, we didn't do a controlled experiment. So it's hard to say, but certainly, um, the people participating in the programs, the people looking back and saying, what are we get, getting as taxpayer worth, uh, do feel it's okay. And these things continue today. I should also say, by the way, RPE has gotten bipartisan support after the first year or so. The first two years of RPE were only Recovery Act. There was no base budget funding. And so the critical time came in 2011, where the president asked for a large increase in the budget. We had $400 million of Recovery Act money for the first two years, roughly $200 million a year. He asked for $300 million the next year. Congress gave him $180 million. But as years went on, we're now close to nearly $400 million a year. In the last two years, of all three years of President Trump's budget, he first asked for $20 million to close it down. The next year, he didn't even ask for 20 million. He asked for zero. He wanted to zero fund it. And, the, and the following year, he also asked for zero. But in each of these times, um, Congress uh, has actually increased it since that time. So, so Steve, let me ask you, what did not go well? I mean, in, in your uh, thing, uh, what yes. could, you know, because now we're talking about a stimulus act, what could we have done better? Yeah. I, I would say when we are giving things away or partnering with industry, there should have been more conditions. Let, let me give you an example. Uh, we gave a lot away in what's called the weatherization program. And in this weatherization program, uh, it's for low division, uh, uh, people who are living within 200% of the poverty line. And uh, they would have to, nothing would come out of their pocket. And so if they were, in a home where, which is underheated and uh, you can convince them to let people crawl around and, and do an energy audit and do these things. 
it wouldn't cost them anything. They'd insulate, they, for example, would uh, close off the leaky drafty spaces. Uh, sometimes they would replace an old boiler. Uh, this is mostly heating, not air conditioning, uh, that we were installing, they would, or uh, an old boiler, an old heater, uh, sometimes blow insulation into the walls. Of course, if there's no insulation in the ceiling, lots of insulation in the ceiling. It did not work well for two reasons. First, that was not a new program. It was a program, in fact, all these programs, the loan program was not a new program either. Uh, all the programs that we did in Recovery Act were actually authorized. That's Washington DC talk, which says that Congress passes a law that says you are allowed to start something, but they don't give you any money. <laughs> and so RPE was authorized in 2007, but it wasn't until 2009 that, uh, and in the Recovery Act, they got money. Weatherization was authorized years ago in the 70s, uh, but, but uh, the people said, we'll, we'll dump a lot more into it. And there you have an A-B comparison. If you look at the years just before Recovery Act and just after, and the idea is that if you invest a certain number of dollars in weatherizing, your return on your capital would be how much money would you have saved had the homeowner invested in it? Right, uh, not the government. So, so the government says we'll invest this money, but we'll make some estimate of utility bills. This is what you would have saved, and they say they would say 1.4, but it's not. It's a funny number, 1.4. First of all, it means they barely saved, but the net present value they chose was 2.7 percent, which is anomalously low. Uh, number one, number two a lot of the savings weren't really monitored. They were estimated. It's sort of like when you build a, a lead building, you make an estimate of the energy costs, but you don't actually go and measure it. And, and so what we could have done, what we should have done is gotten a baseline of what the house was doing, what's the average temperature of that home, did a controlled experiment. You randomly go in and you say, We'll ask these families to do it. We won't ask those families to do it. We'll monitor what happens. And we'll look at the actual energy bills. And you also look at the thermostat because you can also have some evaluation of the comfort level. And so both the advocates of the program and the critics, and boy, there were a lot of critics of the program, uh, were mostly basing criticisms or advocacy on estimates, things like that, where we could have gone hard data. So that was a mistake. To really find out whether uh, it was really worth it in terms of the social dollars spent versus social gain you get. And you can even include in social gain abatement of CO2. Or you can put some price on comfort level. All those things economists do. So we should have done that. Another thing we did, which was very good, but again, where we missed our opportunity to maximize uh, uh, what could have happened is we gave a lot of what are called synchro phasers. These are devices, power management units, that would actually for distribution and, and especially transmission, large centers, they would measure the voltage and the phase. Measurements would come out 60 to 30 times a second. So very, very high frequency measurements of voltage and phase. And these so-called synchro phasers, the idea would be you would link them up to these major substations and you could see a coordinated group, how the grid is interacting with itself. If there's uh, a wobble in the phase uh, or an oscillation in the voltage as is caused by a blackout, certainly more than a wobble, but even with large wind farms beginning to turn on, there are these voltage instabilities. And they were very helpful in actually saying, oh, we're near the threshold of something very bad. If an equipment is about to fail, you can actually begin to see it in these phasers. Um, that was great. The, but what we wanted, what I wanted especially, and we gave out over a thousand of these, was that you can actually form an integrated information in real time, finding out what was going on across all the little power companies that constitute the United States grid. We're not just one big mother power system. <laughs> We've got a lot of little things uh, within certain regions, uh, three, four major regions, but there are a lot of little power companies. And the 
my set of power companies was they consider that confidential information. They don't want to have their competitors know what they're doing, what they're selling, how much water the flows of electricity. And it took about three years before I found they weren't sharing the PMU data with each other, which was the real advantage, because then you have a, a, a full bot eyes view of the grid. They're still not fully sharing. They're beginning to share, the Western sector is beginning to share, the Eastern sector is beginning to share, but they, they're not sharing all over. As we go from 20, 25% renewable energy to 30, 40, 50, 60% renewable energy, we will need these more and more. And they actually have the capability of literally preventing blackouts or at least localizing it. And you begin to see a phase wobble and then you can quickly automatically say, there's something brewing here, what's going on? Isolate it, fix it, rather than the usual, which is wait for a blackout, you shut off things. And when you shut off things, then the power has to be diverted to other lines. Those lines get overloaded, those two shut off. And that's what happened, for example, in the same but the basic, But the basic message is that if the government is giving out money for things, they should have the option of collecting the data, sharing it, analyzing, it, and really doing it like a scientific experiment. That is one big, big lesson learned. I'm gonna hand, in the interest of time, I'm gonna hand this to Sally because she has a question on the international side as well, because you were involved in that too, Sally. So Steve, uh, clean energy, climate change, and increasing global energy access, particularly in emerging economies, these are really global issues. And on the international front, you started the Clean Energy Ministerial, you started the US-China Clean Energy Research Program, uh, you started the US-India Research Program, and given the global nature of these issues and given you know, your experience uh, from these programs, what would you recommend as the top two priorities for international collaboration today? Oh, thank you. Uh, I would say the clean energy ministerial was, is really high on the list. We weren't there to forge international agreements like UN, IPCC, you know, Paris Accords. All we were there to do was say, we have some policies that we use in our country, like appliance standards. And uh, if you use these appliance standards, you can save your country a lot of money. And that in particular made a very big deal because usually what happens in developing countries is they get really cheap junk. For example, uh, air conditioners or refrigerators that weren't allowed to be sold in China by their own country would be dumped in, uh, Southern Africa. Very, very large energy costs. And in many developing countries, electricity is subsidized, just as kerosene is subsidized. And so best, best practices, and said, you don't, you don't even have to set up an energy efficiency center. You can look at what other countries have done and follow two or three years behind and just see, uh, you know, because they're worried about, it's all worry about first costs. That worked great. Um, I think uh, the whole idea that just as this pandemic has shown us that we're all in it together, it's just one big world and there's no way you can put up borders that can actually isolate, uh, try as you will. Uh, climate change, it's impossible. The carbon dioxide, the greenhouse gases go everywhere. Everybody's gonna suffer the consequences. And so then again, sharing best practices and what works in cities, uh, policies, building, uh, encouraging more energy efficient buildings. These things seem to work very well. Sometimes shared research, the US China thing was shared research. There was some good things, especially in the building energy efficiency, less good. They weren't really willing to share electric vehicle technology. One can understand why, because uh, the companies want, if it was, they're successful, they wanted to export it everywhere. But things where it's going to be built or used or operated locally. So it's not as though you can export it, put it on a boat and sell it as a, as a commodity, ship it around the world. Those things, especially, there's no reason, you know, you have a captured market. When you build roads in a country, you know, someone in the country is building roads. So, uh, so it's those things that worked especially well, that you could get honest, discussions of what are called best practices, mostly policy best practices. 
Okay, thank you very much. And uh, we'll turn this back over to Arun for the next segment of the program. Terrific. Uh, Steve, maybe you could get your presentation ready. I know you're going to talk about energy storage, but before and while you do that, we have another quiz and poll. And so maybe we could get this. This is about uh, storage. Uh, and this is just to, as a precursor for uh, Steve's uh, presentation. The U.S. total total electrical power generation capacity is about 1,000 gigawatts. It's about a terawatt. Pumped hydro is more than 90% of all storage capacity in the U.S., storage capacity. Roughly how many gigawatts of pumped hydro capacity does the U.S. have? 20, 40, 60, or 80 gigawatts. So let we have 15 seconds for you to answer this. Okay, the 44%, 20 gigawatts, 29, so it's kind of a decreasing, monotonic decreasing order. 29% is 40, 60, and then 80 is 11%. Uh, I think most people got it right. The, um, the answer is about 22 gigawatts of um, capacity. So it's roughly 20 gigawatts. So correct answer. So Steve, do you want to go on to your presentation? This is an internal review written by Oak Ridge, but uh, reviewing the weatherization. And if you look at the savings to investment ratio uh, before the Recovery Act, retrospective 2008, they found that they broke even. They did a little bit better. The ratio is 1.4. Uh, when they looked at the two years of the Recovery Act, it fell below one, which means the money you're investing isn't being recouped. And if you look back and say, and they ask why it was, they said, we tried to expand too fast. And there were, uh, there were things that went wrong, less well-trained people, too aggressive, started to give out too much money, things of that nature. So if we anticipate a recovery act going into this current recession we're in, there's going to be lessons learned in this. Now, this is the optimistic view. This is internally DOE. Uh, a report commissioned by, uh, from, from Oak Ridge. Uh, th this is uh, the, another point of view. This is um, Michael Greenstone and collaborators who can sometimes be very critical of government programs. And he tried to analyze the weather program itself. And what he did is he took a little, he made a little, he pretended he was the government and tried to, <laughs> during this time and actually tried to convince people to weatherize, things like that. And in the end, in order to recruit these people, they were spending about $1,000 per household weatherized to actually convince them to weatherize. Okay. This is like solar companies trying to convince customers to put solar on the roof. They could spend a third, a quarter, at least a tenth of the cost acquiring customers rather than saying the product sells for it's by itself. Okay. I'll just give you the bottom line. Uh, essentially, it does not pay for itself. It doesn't pay for itself maybe negative fivefold. And if you try to, um, and he's using a discount rate of 3% and 7%, the other guys use 2.7%. But if you say, okay, you just weatherize these homes, uh, how much carbon emission did you actually stop? Uh, and how much do you have to pay for in order uh, to mitigate these carbon emissions? And then he's estimating, depending on whether the weatherization lasts 10 years, 16 years, or 20 years, even at this very low discount rate, he's getting numbers somewhere between $322 and $160 that you per ton that you actually pay by weatherizing homes. Now, I have to say, that there's a lot of fluff in this. There are estimates. Again, no real numbers. And so both sides had no real numbers. <laughs> and, and they're about an order of magnitude apart. <laughs> and so going forward, boy, do I want data. <laughs> right. Uh, so anyway, um, and you know, th there, is a, there is this thing about this. Uh, this is another example of data. This is uh, refrigerators, room air conditioners, clothes washers, and central air conditioners. It's something I started when I was a Secretary of Energy, but uh, it was delayed in publication because we sent it to Science Magazine 
and it got soundly rejected, uh, we were showing data of uh, appliances. The red, the blue number is the cost of purchase and the power and the uh, money you spent on electricity. The arrows are starting with California standards and then uh, national standards. The red is just purchase price costs. And everybody expected when you um, start an appliance standard, you'll increase the purchase price, but the money saved from lower operating costs would make so you break even with some discount rate. And uh, what we found was quite to our surprise was that the purchase price, there was maybe a little kick up in the purchase price for refrigerators, but it, it's, it just went back down the learning curve, which your learning curves, you're applying exponentially shipments on the X axis and price on the Y axis. But what was surprising is Coast Watchers, Central and New American Dishers the purchase price went down, probably because more efficient ones meant smaller compressors. It went back to the drawing board, but that's theory. The fact is it went down. We were very proud of this. We got huge databases. And the, um, the reviewers said, you know, uh, we don't care what these authors, who by the way, seem to be mostly ex-physicists, <laughs> uh, say about this. The economists are not going to believe it. So, so then I said, oh, okay, economists are not like real scientists. They don't really believe in data. But anyway, uh, but you can read, when I start to read their papers, they will make mathematical models. And when they have data that suits their purpose, they stick it in. When they don't, they simulate the data. Yeah, All yeah. right, okay. So let me start off. This is a paper written in 2020 by three ex-RPE veterans. And it says, if I wanted storage, I'm looking at penetration of renewables, wind and solar in the United States, and how much wind or solar would I need in order, uh, how much storage rather would I need in order to get, let's say, 30% penetration? The answer is I would need no wind and storage. In fact, we're getting close to 30% penetration. We don't need much storage. But once, once you go to 50% penetration, uh, then you're beginning to need uh, uh, peak load shifting, significant peak load shifting. But what's surprising is when you go to 80% energy storage, and these are sort of the uncertainties of where you are, you would need, this is time of storage, how, many, how much storage you would need, and somewhere between five to 100 hours worth of storage. So the question is, you don't need to get to seasonal storage in order to get to 80% utilization. But the real question is, how much would it cost to get 10 hour, 100 hour storage? And so uh, these people developed, it was a call for proposals, it was called days for days long storage. And it, it's an interesting uh, exercise. So if you looked at it, they said, okay, anywhere between 10 hour storage 50 hour and 100 hour. And the difference between the green and red dotted lines and dot dashed lines are whether this was utilized 50% of the time or 80% of the time. These are dollars per kilowatt hour, uh, dollars per kilowatt, dollars per kilowatt hour. So energy storage has two things, how much power it can deliver and how much energy over a period of time it can deliver. And they're actually not too far apart. And, and so we need both. And so in this, they were saying, is there something that could be technologically developed that would, could come into this price range of say, a hundred, say of order a hundred dollars per kilowatt. And so for 50 hour storage, uh, something like $20 per kilowatt hour. So that was the challenge. Lithium ion batteries were even a decade from now, we'll be landing at somewhere around $200 per kilowatt hour. And so they're asking, can you get something that would be an order of magnitude cheaper than lithium ion batteries? Uh, pump hydro storage and compressed air storage, they put up here, but I will say that it's not exactly that. Another form of energy storage has to do with taking excess electricity and turning it into a chemical form. Uh, the most talked about is taking 
uh, electricity and hydrolyzing water. Uh, and if you look at on the x-axis, the cost of energy and how many dollars per megawatt hour does it cost uh, to, uh, to make this versus uh, how many kilograms of hydrogen you can actually make. The current price at the gate, at, at the user, is maybe a dollar to a dollar fifty per kilogram of hydrogen, which has to be trucked in. Uh, this white line is the current electrolyzers we use today, and you see that at forty dollars a megawatt hour, four cents a kilowatt hour, uh, the electricity cost alone would be more than the uh, market price. But if you had electricity at a dollar fifty uh, per kilowatt hour, uh, fifteen dollars a megawatt hour, you see that uh, the cost of the energy would only be half the cost which opens up the possibility with efficient electrolyzers, you can actually do something. Um, I'm gonna skip these curves because they're really just saying these are estimates from EIA, McKinsey and others about how to actually, what the estimates will be by 1920, 1930 uh, with an anticipation of lower costs and more excess uh, renewable energy. I should say this electrolysis of water is a very old technology, but it's being looked at in new ways. Uh, we all know from high school, if you put in positive and negative, you get oxygen, hydrogen bubbles. This is a cartoon uh, of a catalyst on the oxygen side. Uh, when you make oxygen on that catalyst side, the, the oxygen is very insoluble. And so they run around and find each other and make little bubbles. And finally, the bubbles are releasing the type of the oxygen. So here's the point. When the bubble grows, uh, you have to, it's a resistance to the formation because there's surface tension collapsing the bubble. So it adds to the electrical resistance. And as the bubble gets bigger and bigger, it's actually blocking catalytic sites. And so people, including myself, are saying you don't want bubbles. If you could avoid bubbles and allow the gases, oxygen, and hydrogen, as soon as they're made to be within microns of some hydrophilic border where the gases are allowed to escape, you can greatly reduce the resistance. And so these are some technical things. Right now, where does hydrogen come from? It comes from um, steam methane reforming. That's what SMR stands for. You take uh, natural gas and you can convert it essentially in when all is said and done to hydrogen and CO2, you vent the CO2. So although hydrogen is a clean fuel, it's not the full life cycle is not, not clean at all. It emits as much um, CO2 as is if you burn the natural gas. So, so what happens is the possibility of using uh, electrolytic formation of CO2 means that you greatly reduce the uh, CO2 output. There's a possibility that hydrogen can go negative if you use uh, biomass materials and efficiently turn this biomass into hydrogen and sequester the hydrogen. And at that point, hydrogen uh, is not only a low carbon fuel, it becomes negative. Again, I don't want to go into the details of that, but the, the possibility of this happening and what are the artifacts in this uh, are an issue. Uh, of course, it's the collection of the biomass, which is a major issue. But still, people are beginning to relook at hydrogen for this reason. Now, hydrogen is, people are seriously considering hydrogen as stationary storages. You get the hydrogen, you pump it underground in a hollowed out salt cavern at moderately low pressures, hundreds of PSI. Uh, not seriously considered for general fueling of vehicles, except for long haul trucks with central fueling stops, because we don't have a distribution line. Uh, but if you can store hydrogen locally in an underground cavern, that could work. You can always fuel a vehicle faster with hydrogen than electric vehicle, uh, because you can pump in the gases and chemicals much faster than charging a battery. But what is lacking is the gas infrastructure. People talk about repurposing natural gas lines, but unfortunately, um, you need higher pressures 
and hydrogen uh, seeps into the steel and it's, there's embrittlement and the pipes fail. This is a materials problem that has not been solved for decades. And so we don't really know whether it's possible to get steel pipes that uh, have hydrogen. So now the talk is having fiber reinforced polymer pipes and whether you can make these uh, inexpensively enough uh, when you go to scale. And the claim uh, in some places like Oak Ridge are yes, you can, that these indeed could be less than the cost of steel pipes. Uh, and so if you can make these and make them so they don't leak out hydrogen or very, very low, uh, so you get rid of the metal because people are beginning to say, we may never solve the embrittlement problem. And you have this, this could work, but again, this is more uh, research and development. Um, the costs are uh, for the pipelines, uh, things like that, but, uh, but a huge cost of pipelines, roughly half the cost of right of way. So if you begin to say, if we're gonna to go to a partial hydrogen economy, you use the existing pipeline right of way, you've actually got rid of half your costs and you replace the steel gas pipelines with hydrogen pipelines, it may be feasible, uh, but it really depends on the technology, how well you can make these pipes how well you can seal them compared to your standard seal pipes. Okay, so let me go to this several day storage. This is an RPE, a recent RPE uh, call for proposals for long duration addition to electricity storage, uh, several day storage. And again, it comes in two tranches. It comes for store for one day and, you know, uh, say 10 hours and store for up to 100 hours. And what they said in this proposal is say, let's assume you buy electricity at two and a half cents a kilowatt hour, and the whole electrical storage into some other form of energy, and the conversion of that energy back into electricity, uh, we're gonna say, well, let's keep, you've got to keep the price below five cents a kilowatt hour. So you sell at seven and a half cents a kilowatt hour. You're buying energy or power at two and a half cents a kilowatt hour, energy two and a half cents a kilowatt hour, you're selling at five and a half, seven and a half. Uh, how does that compare to natural gas um, standby generation? Uh, they chose these numbers because that's what they think future natural gas combined cycle plants will cost, somewhere between four to seven cents a kilowatt hour. And so they say, if you come at these values, perhaps you will be competitive without a cost of carbon. So that was the idea. Now, if you think about turning electricity into energy storage, the most important thing that hits you in the face is that the conversion of electricity into mechanical motion, as in a motor, or the conversion of mechanical motion, rotary motion, into electrical energy, as in a generator, can be greater than 95% and in some cases even greater than 99% efficient. Very, very high technology motors can be made. So if you have electricity from renewable energy, wind or solar, what you want to do is turn that electricity into something that you can recover back in terms of mechanical motion in a, in a generator motor. I'm gonna skip these lines and say, that it turns out the most efficient energy storage is you take that electricity and you pump water up a hill. And if you look at all the energy storage across uh, the world today, you find that pumped hydro storage dominates way more than thermal storage, electrochemical battery storage or elect electromechanical storage. It turns out if you have a height of more than uh, 250 feet or so, the round trip efficiencies can actually exceed 80%. Once, you, once you're at a uh, few hundred meters, we're reaching as high as 85%. That is better than a chemical flow battery. It's not as good as the lithium ion battery, which is about 95%. But in terms of energy storage, it's really one of the best. Uh, the problem with hydro is that it takes a long time to get permitting. There are a lot of, uh, certain types of environmentalists who are very much against a hydro storage. 
even if you have an existing dam and put below the dam a few percent uh, pool that you can pump up and down there against that as well. So that's an issue. Um, and if you look at hydroelectricity in the world, China leads the world by far in hydroelectricity. This is 2014, and uh, they're actually on their way to increasing this by 50%. Uh, if you look at pump storage in the world, Japan actually leads uh, in pump storage. Uh, but China is now, by the end of this year, or at the latest next year, they will become the leader in pump storage. Uh, the United States is not is uh, beginning to catch up, actually, only in the last few years. So what's the idea of pump storage? It's gravity. You take your electricity, and you if you take this mechanical motion, and you pump water up a hill. So it's essentially it still remains as roughly mechanical motion. When you want the energy, you you, these turbines work both ways and you know, the flow down, but you don't throw the water away, you keep it downhill. So you're just actually pumping between an upper and a lower reservoir. So this is schematically what the picture looks like. Uh, this is a more detailed version of this. You have, you know, water coming in, turning some turbo vanes, exiting out here, turns the shaft and turns the generator. Um, this is one of those turbo vanes, and this is this variable speed generator. New technology is variable speed generators, meaning that you can have the motor perform at high efficiencies in conversion of electricity to mechanical power or vice versa at different speeds. So you can take out the power you need, but I just want to impress upon you the scale of these devices. Those are the people. These are people and they're normal sized people. And so these uh, generators are quite large. Uh, the pipes in which uh, the water flows to the generators are also quite large. Everything is very large. There are, there are I believe, ways of getting pumped hydro to least costs and people are beginning to look at now standardized parts. Right now, dams remain as one offs. Okay. Are the more pump storage places around the world? And the answer is yes. There's a group in Australia, this is the website, and those little dots, and where you see red dots, they say these are very good pump storage. It's an atlas all around the world. Of those are the places where you have large height differences, let's say 100 meters or higher, that can mean very efficient uh, and lower cost pump storage. Now, of course, no countries can build on all these sites, but a small fraction of these sites can really substantially improve uh, energy storage. Let me give you an example of something that's taken roughly 10 years to permit. This is an abandoned mine in uh, California, in Eastern Riverside County, California. This is this big hollow space, which is an open pit mine. And uh, they wanted to make this and a, a, a section below a lower reservoir. This is the upper reservoir. Uh, and to use it for pump storage. Um, this is typically what happens to our mines. They're kind of left in the state. Uh, environmentalists fought this for a very, very long time. FERC finally gave it a permit and they're proceeding ahead. Uh, and since the mining costs have already been paid for, you've got the big hole. All you need to do is put in the turbines, the pen socks, the things that allow the water to flow, the generating station, and then a line. Uh, you're free. There is an added cost. The environmental said you can't use fresh water. You're going to ruin the water supply in the United States. So in the end, they compromise and they have some desalination uh, plants. So they will take some brinish, brackish water and fill it up with that. But nevertheless, it's still, they believe it's still economical. Um, here's the thing about pump storage. And, and this is something, if I were going to do this again, I would look at large projects that have very long time scales and give them and pump storage time scales can be quite long the generators can last 50 years the dam itself uh, we know lasts roughly 100 years many dams that we built 100 years ago are still in operation 
And but the issue is when you do make these investments, what do you take as the cycle of these pump storage things? Uh, I believe a conservative estimate is a 50 year cycle. The dam itself, which is at half the cost, you can say 100 years because many dams are 100 years old. But it, it then depends on the discount rate. If you take a seven to 10 percent discount rate per year, you're getting no credit for an energy asset that could last 100 years. So it's partly an economic thing and how we can arrange for tax credits or something like that to allow pump storage to work, to be economically more than competitive. Um, but again, uh, there's been a resurgence and a look at pump storage because it is the one thing we do have and we do know it works and it lasts a long time. And in this relook at pump storage, uh, what I'm finding out is that it's landing in places significantly better, for example, than chemical batteries. So that's one thing. An innovative pump storage uh, generated by a theoretical physicist at UC Santa Barbara, Phil Lubin. Um, and his idea of pump storage is, well, you know, if height is good, the oceans are deep. And so if you put these canisters down the seafloor bottom one or two kilometers below and you pump air, compressed air into this and displace, uh, so you displace the seawater down here. This is a concrete ballast that keeps it uh, situated on the seafloor. Uh, they're thin pipes because you, the pipes have to withstand this tremendously high pressure of one or two kilometers deep because at the top of the pipe, you have one atmosphere of pressure, down below you have many hundreds of atmospheres. In any case, um, just pumping air down and leaving it up, again, it's mechanical. So it's going from electricity motors to pumps to doing something like that. Uh, and as you pump it down, uh, you use a heat exchange mechanism. So as the air compresses, it heats up, which means it makes it harder, you have to do more work. So you have what's called isothermal cooling. So it cools down, but it's a heat exchange that works both ways. So as you allow the pressure to come up, then with isothermal heating, you don't lose that pressure. And so this reservoir is now your ocean. And the idea is you can get isothermal heating and cooling. If you can make that efficient, then there is no thermodynamic loss in the pumping down of the gas, which will heat up or will cool down when it expands. So this is part of this technology. Um, compressed air storage, again, the same idea. What they're thinking now is adiabatic storage. So as you pump air in, as it heats up, you cannot have it heat up too much or you can't get that much into your cavern for temperature low reasons and it's also thermodynamically inefficient. Can you store the heat adiabatically and so when you, when you expand the gas, it's expanded and cools, can you recover the heat to drive the turbine? Trouble is even adiabatic, and the two air compressed storage we have don't have any of this, but can adiabatic really do the trick? Uh, because when you store the heat adiabatically, it does leave a lot for the uh, energy storage temperature qualities of that adiabatic um, container. The idea that you can actually build a salt home is something which we are capable of doing. You can send in rock, you can hollow out a salt home, and then this makes a very good sealant. This is good for pumped air storage, it's good for hydrogen storage, uh, and we sometimes use it for natural gas reservoirs. So here the, the idea is, is your, you pump in uh, water, uh, you, you get up briny water, and then after you've hollowed it out you, you, and when you have sufficiently good cap rock, you can do this. Uh, the next new kid on the block is try to design isothermal storage. If the isothermal storage is 100% efficient, again, as you're compressing the air, um, you're giving it to the reservoir so you don't do any extra heat in compressing this. So it does begin to look like an electrical motor, just something mechanical. As the gas expands, it cools down, but if it's isothermal heating again, it, it looks more like a mechanical. So, so these are things that are looking at, and if you can get good isothermal compression and reheating, uh, then these large scale energy storage devices begin to look very good. All right. The last, the last thing is 
everything I've shown you, pump hydro, pump gas storage, is mechanical. It's electrical motor to lift mechanical. People are actually thinking of electrical motor to lift weights. But it turns out lifting weights and steel cables and something don't seem to be as efficient as in pumping fluids, water, especially water because it's incompressible. You lose no extra energy. But what about using electricity just to heat something up? If you have one and a half cents a kilowatt hour and you do an energy conversion, that's $4.40 a million BTU, which is uh, comparable or less than the cost of natural gas in many places around the world. And so, so then the question is, what about using electricity? And there, these are some of the places around the world where natural gas prices are destined to be. And if you have any modest price on carbon, for example, uh, $60 a ton, you just added another $10 per million BTU to natural gas. So renewable electricity will undercut natural gas. The question is, all the other stuff, can it be made uh, cheap enough so that you're doing better than natural gas. And it goes to utility scale thermal storage. I'm gonna skip this stuff. This is the worst thing you can do. Um, you can take electricity and you can put a resistor in a vat of molten salt and heat it up. And then you have this vat of molten salt that you heat up and you have an exchange and you heat up steam or something like that. It spins a turbine. You reject out low temperature heat, you recompress that, and then you heat it back up. Uh, this is what we do <clears throat> when we put in uh, coal, for example, or natural gas. Uh, I'm going to skip these things and uh, just say I'm going to skip all the thermodynamics and I'm just going to get to the fact that there are better ways, very novel ways of re reinventing how do you take electrical energy, turn it into heat and make it come back. Uh, and it actually goes to, I'm just going to go directly to this diagram, just focus on this diagram here. Uh, you, here, here you have electricity coming in and you take a low temperature reservoir and you use a mechanical engine, in this case a turbine, either a Rankine engine turbine or a Brayton cycle turbine, and you take fluid and you, and you take low temperature heat and put it into high temperature heat. If this were a fluid, it would be pump storage. But the question is, can you mimic mechanical energy into getting a heat pump that takes energy from low temperature to high temperature uh, when you're so-called charging it or lifting water? And can you take this high energy in the same engine, of, let's say a Brayton turbine, uh, and, you, and you put it into a low storage tank uh, and discharge it? So, so these so-called Carnot batteries, where you have the electricity, you pump it into hot or cold reservoirs, and then you take that energy and use another heat pump, another turbine of some kind, to turn it into thermal power and you make electricity. So this has been taking a fresh look. Days is investing in a number of programs. Uh, one such cycle, I'll just close with this, uh, was proposed by Bob Laughlin in the physics department here at Stanford in 2017, which is a part of an evolution of the so-called Brayton type of heat pumps. Instead of two reservoirs, a hot and a cold, he says, I want four reservoirs. So I have a very hot reservoir uh, oscillating with uh, another cold reservoir and I've got another hot reservoir, another cold reservoir. This is my Brayton cycle pump and so for example, in charging, so-called charging, you use electrical energy, mechanical energy. You take energy from the cold side, you compress it onto the hot side. Now, this idea has two things. Uh, mostly you're worried about very high temperatures, so you lower the highest temperatures by actually operating these reservoirs below room temperature. And so that's Point number one. Point number two is he uses what's called a regenerator, something well known to mechanical engineers in the power generation business, to actually more efficiently don't lose any of the energy as you're sloshing this, the energy from cold to hot, hot to cold, really to try to mimic pump storage. And whether you can get it to heat to mimic pump storage remains the question. 
in this paper and other papers, it's being claimed that perhaps you can get to 70% Carnot efficiency. If there was 100% uh, thermodynamic efficiency in the compressor and expander, uh, if this was working at 100% efficiency and the heat exchangers were working at 100% efficiency, this would have an efficiency of 100%. And then the question is, uh, what will it really have? And using what Bob Alton thinks are realistic numbers of efficiencies, and getting to the highest temperature differences he can get with known existing materials, he thinks he can get to 70% efficiency, which would be excellent. Uh, if you don't try, you get a 40% efficiency. There is a world of difference between 40 and 70% energy. A lot of new companies beginning to look at this. I'm going to skip this. Uh, one, one final comment is that in, in terms of the fluid that you use in these turbines, people are beginning to think that carbon dioxide is in a closed cycle is maybe the best fluid. I just want to not go into it, but supercritical carbon dioxide has a density of half of water. So the size of a 300 megawatt turbine comes to this size. And there are a lot of other advantages. It's less corrosive, many other things. Um, but let me uh, uh, just close here. There's new flow batteries. And go back to this day's call for proposals. The exciting thing is, by the time you have 100 days storage, you could be 80% renewable wind and energy. Uh, and uh, I think with all the pump storage that is untapped, that could be made without uh, offending uh, a class of environmentalists, uh, you can get this 100-day storage in combination with thermal storage. At least that's the hope. We'll see what's happening. And uh, we'll see how the public responds to, uh, would you rather have carbon-free energy and a few more ponds of water? All right, thank you. Thanks, Steve. Um, so to get the Q&A started, like we normally do, we will have a student ask the first question, and then we'll go back and forth between Sally and me and the student. And we have uh, Will uh, Ghent, who's actually not a student. He just finished his PhD. Um, uh, and he will ask the first question. Will, go ahead. All right, thank you. Um, so yeah, I have uh, some questions that were submitted from the current and former members of the Stanford community. And so the first question, uh, Dr. Shi, you mentioned a lot about the research and infrastructure investment needed uh, to make hydrogen a viable long duration storage technology. Do you see those necessary investments being made in the US and what do you see the role of hydrogen being in the future? Um, yeah, I, I think uh, both government investments, but also private sector. Uh, about three or four years ago, I'm an advisory board to Shell and so forth. Shell Science Council. And I began to realize that if electricity really is going to be one and a half, even two cents a kilowatt hour, and the Shell people said it is going to be like that, 20, 30, 20, 40 with the latest, then you can use electrolysis. And since that time, it's been part of Shell's strategy. And they're beginning to invest considerable money into making more efficient electrolysis, doing things like that. There is no solution yet to the pipeline, <laughs> but they're beginning to look at using right of way and, and uh, a fiber piping, things like that. Uh, it's for stationary storage, definitely for centralized fueling, uh, that is also going to work. But also hydrogen, because they're the biggest users of hydrogen, they, the oil and gas companies, because they take icky heavy crude and turn it high value products. So there, that's the biggest commercial use of hydrogen. But beyond that, uh, hydrogen, uh, we'd love it if you can convert hydrogen and CO2 into hydrocarbons with clean energy. Then the transportation, long haul transportation problem is solved. That we don't have yet, but just hydrogen as the energy storage medium or ammonia as another one are things that they're looking at very seriously. And, and uh, you know, the U.S. government, um, uh, DOE does uh, invest something in hydrogen. I'm not sure the American oil companies are doing this, but I, I can tell you uh, Royal Dutch Shell is. 
Okay, let's, uh, let's move on to the next question. Um, so the question is, how should the Department of Energy be restructured or what activities should it add to its portfolio to help bring ARPA-E or other technologies uh, that it's invested in to maturity? Well, it's, it's, I'm not sure if it was a restructuring. I'm thinking, you know, Rune would remember in 2010, we formed Sunshot with the same, you know, feelings and abilities and looking for the town that we got in ARPA-E. And so Sunshot was actually a clone of ARPA-E in a certain sense, but it was focused on photovoltaics and solar thermal but very, very capable people. We didn't actually have a substantially bigger budget, but I started getting things. Did you guys double your budget or something? I said, no, uh, we went up by 5%. I said, oh, really? Well, something's changed. <laughs> and you're funding the right stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so, uh, so I think there's just getting really talented people. One of the things Department of Energy really has to do, and they do, terrible job is they they create paperwork like you cannot believe and if we, despite all the good things in the loan program the loan program paperwork was horrendous and if you got out of government loan it's as if uh during the whole time you have that loan it's as if uh you've got a government colonoscopy without anesthesia up you the whole time generating tons of uh, re reporting requirements and compliance you're just crazy and so one of the things, so there's a huge overhead and a lot of companies didn't want to cut your government loan, but they said, I don't want to deal with all this paperwork. If you notice in the COVID-19 crisis, they wanted to get some money out to people. They did not create a government program. They said, we'll let the banks get it out. The only trouble is they gave it to the big commercial banks. Finally, they got wise and said, you know, we need to set aside a little money for the little banks because we need to get the little people. This idea of using the private sector to disperse seems to be more efficient. Okay, and we and the best of all possible things, and I mentioned this, if we work with banks so that they do some of the legwork, uh, because the paperwork and weatherizing housing, the paperwork and getting loans programs for that is horrendous. horrendous. Uh, because if you slip up and there's a little bit of a scandal, then the opposite part is all over you. Uh, and, and it becomes very inefficient. So I think uh, there's something in the middle where the government can co-opt the private sectors to do it. Uh, the private sector has to take some of the responsibility, but to get the money out faster because of the larger bureaucracy and unfortunately, in the DOE as in other bureaucracies, um, you, you constantly have to have your machete and hacking at the growing bureaucracy year after year after year, just to keep even. If you let up one year, it just grows. <laughs> and so, uh, so this, is, this is something that uh, the, is true of the US government, but it's also really true of the Department of Energy. Uh, you gotta get really good people and you've got to always fight the bureaucracy growth. Okay, well, thank you for that graphic image as well. <laughs> um, Will, you have another question? Right, um, so this one is about the, uh, the global supply chain for batteries. Um, so today, most of the supply chain is overseas, largely in China. Um, should the US do something to help create a supply chain in the US? And if so, what, what needs to be done? The, the short answer is yes. Uh, there's no way we could allow critical manufacturing to proceed only in certain countries, especially countries who are not above using that to control the markets. Uh, uh, and batteries is one of them. They tried to corner and largely did uh, corner the market in rare earths for displays and for efficient electrical motors. Um, uh, we're fighting this because rare earths are not rare. It's just a very polluting mining situation. And so we have to mine the rare earths in a way with improved uh, uh, environmental concerns. Uh, batteries, definitely. But I, I would say it's the same of a lot of key industries. Um, uh, the next one would be integrated circuit chips. Uh, there are only two major players, uh, TSMC in Taiwan, and Intel. 
uh, IBM is no longer in the business. Oh, and there are no other real major players uh, and a little bit of uh, Samsung uh, for, for, for memory. Uh, and so certain key industries, I would say the government should have a, protect them a little bit, okay? Because China Incorporated has no bones about have, having, helping these key industries and nurturing them and, and supplying them with all sorts of help. And if the United States says, stands and said, we want to be pure, we don't want to do this, uh, uh, we're at a disadvantage. You know, in the end, if you look at Airbus versus Boeing, uh, we subsidize them in different ways. We subsidize Boeing because of the military contract. Uh, and Airbus just subsidized it directly. <laughs> uh, but without subsidy, if uh, either Boeing or Airbus didn't get subsidies, the other one would win. So I, could, I would say, I would look at any of these key industries in energy technologies um, and say, yes, uh, you cannot depend on just pure superior ingenuity when you have huge financial backing. So Steve, let me ask you, I mean, you, you gave this really nice and, you know, um, talk on storage and you highlighted pumped hydro and, and various other opportunities to really reduce the cost. But this also, I mean, if you're looking at the uh, intermittency of renewables, there are options to minimize the storage investments by looking at high voltage DC transmission, effective demand management. You have electric vehicles that'll be on the grid that could be leveraged as well uh, to some extent. So if you, if you really were to design an optimal system, um, what would be, how do these interplay with each other? Well, uh, I think demand side management is something very real. Uh, you can give financial incentives uh, the financial incentives should leak into building buildings with a little more thermal inertia. <laughs> so we're talking mostly about air conditioning. If you start to shut off, you know, it's hottest, you need most air conditioning around 4 p.m. Uh, and uh, it, if you had enough thermal inertia, uh, the occupants wouldn't suffer that much. The other thing that's not fully appreciated is decouple the cooling from the air circulation. What I find is uh, if you have a ceiling fan, you need far less air conditioning. <laughs> uh, and so there are many, many things like that. But, but in the end, you will still need storage. And so we're, but we're talking a few percent of total capacity, right? Uh, to really change the needle. Uh, so the original idea, first the idea is we have all that we need, we can go to 100% renewable, is just, you know, someone's smoking something. <laughs> but but the opposite is also true. You you don't need one third of your total average output storage in order to get to eighty percent. You need far less than that if you have a reasonably good transmission distribution system, right? Which goes to everything else that I was talking about: the phasers, the long distance transmission, all these things. And you you there. It's an optimization. When do you do long distance transmission? And when do you do energy storage? And it also depends on the technology. The technology for long distance transmission is improving, led by China. They're now sending six gigawatts per wire for two wires on high voltage DC. That's a lot of power. Uh, and uh, Germany and other countries are now taking the same towers they use and replacing with DC lines and you get five times more power, six times more power, same right of way. So there are things like that the United States should be doing. In a new recovery act, what I would spend my money on would be these long-term infrastructure issues. But it has to be, you don't give this away for free. It would have to be at least a 50% match, maybe a two thirds match. So that the companies who are investing in this know that they have a good business case. The best thing we could do is to clear the right of way crap. When I was Secretary of Energy, I was trying to do transmission lines and I wanted to do, get it from 11 years to three years. The resistance I ran into was enormous. From the Obama administration, Secretary Salazar, Interior, he was all for it, but within his administration, Fish and Wildlife game, they, wouldn't, they, they were the biggest resistors. There's no way you're gonna send transmission lines to where I hunt and fish. <laughs> and so 
I think, you know, if you want to live in a, uh, a two degree world instead of a four degree world, <laughs> there has to be a different discussion. <laughs> I'm going to combine two of the questions we had uh, from the audience into one. Um, so the first one was about small modular pumped hydro systems. Uh, you know, are these viable and, you know, does it create a real alternative to having to build dams and go through the permitting process? So that's part of the question. The second one is a little bit bigger question. And it's, you know, to what extent should small modular distributed microgrid systems be viewed as an alternative to replacing aging energy infrastructure in developed economies. And then likewise, in developing economies, you know, should they, should we think of those as a fundamental element of, a, of the energy system in those areas? Okay. Great questions. Um, I'm a big fan of small modular anything that you build in a factory and ship them everywhere around the world. Uh, people are beginning to look at hydro. And instead of these, you know, I showed you pictures of these beautiful one-offs. Uh, and just like all the nuclear reactors were one-offs. And so now it's the realization that if you can, especially for smaller ones, where you can take run of river, put a small holding pond, pump it up there, and then let it go back down. So you haven't really done anything to the river. You haven't destroyed the fish in the river, all sorts of things that are objectionable. Uh, there are fish friendly turbines, but it's harder when the things get bigger. So small modular reactor hydro, uh, small modular hydro is, could really help a lot. Uh, and all you're, you're comparing to is a battery. So you don't have to say, well, the old time we had, you know, 300 to one gigawatt generators, which are crazy. You know, you don't think of batteries giving one gigawatt. <laughs> Uh, and, and so, you know, and to, for hydro, small is 50 megawatts. Well, that's a reason, reasonably big battery. And so I think we have to rethink this. Uh, now, distributed versus other, it really depends. It, because you, it's like, um, you always want to put your wind farms and your solar in the best sites. You want to put your pumped hydro in the best sites. The best sites have the highest vertical drop. Uh, and so it's then it's just a trade-off. You know, transmission is not cheap. People don't like transmission lines. Uh, you, so I don't see it's either or. I think it's, it's going to be both. There is more resiliency the more you have local generation and local storage, for sure. And so you can factor all that in. OK, thank you. So let me uh, turn the several questions on geothermal and geothermal being that if you could do this, it's uh, zero carbon as well as you may not need the storage. You, you can use it when you need to. Um, and it generally is a question of cost. And I was wondering if you could comment on what you have seen and what needs to be done to bring down the cost of geothermal and do it in a way that it's could be uh, used in multiple places not just in the thermal gradient areas? Well, okay, so right now, most virtually all the geothermal we have is what I call natural geothermal. You have a natural source of water. The water is the heat fluid for the conductivity, and uh, they are in a high grading where local, you don't have to go too deep where there's local hots. So, okay, so hot springs places, works well, um, but there are very, very few places, far less than pump storage sites. <laughs> where you have natural flow of water that actually have this. So then you go to what's called enhanced geothermal where you have a fluid and you have hot rock. You still want a site where there's a very high gradient uh, to get to pretty hot stuff. Uh, and so that has a little bit of tension because the places where you have a high thermal gradient are places which are generally speaking more geologically unstable. And if you start pumping in fluid, and you start setting off tremors, uh, this makes people nervous. And so, so this is one of the issues. Now, having said that, I think it's possible. Uh, I don't know of any large demos, but uh, the fluid of, uh, of choice would probably be carbon dioxide, even better than water. Uh, it doesn't have the beautiful heat capacity of water, but it has about half the density at these temperatures and pressures and it can seep through with less resistance. Now, so the, the idea is now you're pumping fluid, either 
CO2 or water, you pump it down uh, and you learn to develop very rapid small bore drilling that then pumps the fluid and has it come back up. That technology, that's one of the RPE things that did work, uh, that you can uh, drill very rapidly with less weight on bit because you're using a laser to help uh, chew up the rock. Um, these things are being looked at. To the best of my knowledge, I don't know of any really successful ones being tried yet. You, you may know, but, but the other thing about enhanced geothermal is it's not a permanent source uh, because unlike the hot springs we now have, they're regarded as semi-permanent. It's a steady state thing because nature has been very kind in these spots, but very few sites, spots. Uh, you actually go and you mine the heat and after about 40 or 50 years, you've taken out too much heat, the gradient is less because rock, dry rock is a good insulator. Okay. So, and you remember, you're pumping in the fluid. <laughs> and so what, the, what enables the current geothermal sources, there's a lot of water around, so you're taking heat from the rest of the earth. Um, so I don't see geothermal, uh, it's so geographically limiting until you go to enhanced geothermal where you pump in fluid. Uh, and so it remains to me thing, uh, you know, we'll see what happens to uh, pumped thermal. If you can get pumped thermal at 65% efficient, okay? That's a big deal. That, that's a big deal. You can put that anywhere. So, uh We'll, we'll finish with two questions. Will has another one. Um, go ahead, Will. Okay. Um, so Cleantech 1.0 was the name given to the initial wave of private sector investment um, in the early 2000s in clean energy and energy storage. Uh, now there's kind of a second wave called Cleantech 2.0. Um, do you believe that the private sector has learned the necessary lessons from the first wave of investments? Golly. That I don't know. Um, what I saw in this very euphoric investment period about the time President Obama got elected is that there was a feeling that this, we, now we've got the right president, we had the right Congress, we're gonna, you know, things will go our way. And a lot of investors invested in lots of clean tech and lost their shirt. And what I saw was many of the investors actually, you know, they, they made their fortunes on internet companies or information tech companies. And very, very different than an energy company where uh, margin, the time scale is much longer, the margins are much smaller, and it's real hardware. And so it's a very, very different sort of business. Uh, and sadly, the most knowledgeable people in businesses like us with the old people, the GEs and the Siemens of the world. Uh, uh, people like that, it really had engineers and a long tradition of engineering excellence. Um, and when the new startups come along, uh, they have to relearn all this stuff. So Tesla was a great example, great, great idea of a car. The Tesla battery electrical system is one of the world's best, if not the world's best. The ability to manufacture the rest of the car that the <laughs> manufacturers figured out 30 years ago, they had to learn to make the doors fit and things like that. And so, so I think uh, energy is a little bit of, you know, you, you know, there's hundreds of years of manufacturing experience <laughs> that people know coupled to these new technologies that you'd love to see. I mean, if we could get the G's is now, is now in shambles and, and Siemens is, is looking around, if we can get those type of engineers to couple with some of the other people, that would be great. Uh, because you want to tap in these years, you know, mechanical engineers and chemical engineers understand thermodynamics far more deeply than a physicist. I, I won't <laughs> disagree with you on that one, Steve. <laughs> Why? <laughs> they know heat exchanges. <laughs> so let me ask the last question. We have only a minute left. Um, if you look at the Paris Agreement, and let's talk global, because this is a global energy dialogue. Um, the Paris Agreement, before the year before that, the US and China got together and actually had a, a discussion and an agreement on what to do, which is why the Paris Agreement, as opposed to the Copenhagen, was much more successful and got the whole world together. And right now, the 
you know, things are not as, um, you know, the relationship in the US and China is not as good. If you look ahead now, we, you know, the climate change is not waiting for us. Um, what should the US, China, India, EU be doing? What should we do internally in the United States to really address climate change from the energy perspective? And also what should we do globally? If you have a quick sort of thoughts on that, that'd be great. Yeah, I think um, it's, it's very sad because, uh, well, look, we should have an administration that actually listens to scientists. Um, we start with that. Uh, it's just as we really need an administration that listens to medical warnings and risks of COVID-19. Uh, the climate risks are much deeper uh, that will last millennia. And so then you need to say, okay, these, these are the risks. These, with these risks, it's once you sort of develop a risk, you can begin to talk about uh, uh, the least costly way of mitigating the risk, adapting to risks, things like that. Uh, but right now we're not there yet. And so, uh, in fact, we've turned away from that. And uh, so the hope when Obama was president uh, and we had a different world and we had the EU28, the hope was that China, US, and the EU would lead the way. With those three leading the way, that actually gets most of the world because the developing world, its fraction of greenhouse gases is very, very small. And if those people actually establish a price on carbon and started doing those things, it wouldn't really punish the developing world because they're, they, they're so carbon in and non-intensive. Certainly believe that capital has to flow to developing countries. Uh, that the richer countries uh, have more wealth, they can adapt better, and it would help speed it along. Uh, I'm a big believer in that. Uh, if, the, if we take the attitude, uh, no, why should we, you know, say it's paid for anyone else's things, we're going to look at it after number one. Uh, well, that's sort of what U.S. society did has been doing for a while, and it comes back and bites you. And so we saw this in the COVID crisis, the you know, two different types of populations and how they can deal with this medical emergency. We see this in the way uh, the police treat different sectors of society. Uh, climate change is this whole thing magnified. Uh, one world, one planet, we've got to do this. And, and so I think there's a few things like that. Uh, the United States, uh, for a while, uh, has been leading in the technologies. Uh, uh, but uh, now even to have us collaborate on things, again, going back to some of the original questions, like in energy efficient buildings, sharing best practices in energy efficient buildings. Well, the Chinese are going to build the buildings in China and the U.S. will build buildings in the United States. It's rare that you get a Chinese company comes in the United States and builds a building, although I wouldn't put it past <laughs> anything. <laughs> but but uh, then sharing these best practices. So, so there's so many things that one can do. Of course, the price in carbon is essential. Uh, but And we know Europe did the experiment. $30, a, uh, 30 euros a ton doesn't do anything. Uh, it, it, and it's got to be 60 or above, and people have to have confidence that it's going to stay at 60 to 80 or above. Uh, you can ramp up slowly, but it's just got to stay there. Uh, and, and so there are many things that can be done. When you have things like that, that also, I'm a big believer, that's going to stimulate huge innovations. You know, I'm pretty confident we'll get much better batteries and we'll get thermal storage. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be $30 a kilowatt hour, but it, it's, it's going to be less than 50. And that would be very good because batteries, the full scale, all in costs are about 200. And so, you know, thank you. We'll see. Thank you, Steve. And thank you, Steve, for a wonderful dive. This could go on for many hours, but we have to uh, end now. And uh, let's all thank Secretary Chu uh, for this discussion and dialogue and the presentation. And to the audience worldwide, we hope you found this dialogue to be informative and, and useful and enjoyable. 
we invite you again to join us at the next Global Energy Dialogue, which will be on July 7th. And we will have Chad Holliday, the chairman of the board of Royal Dutch Shell for a dialogue. And we will do this every two weeks. And please come and join us. And on behalf of the entire Stanford Precord Institute for Energy, we really thank you for joining us. Thank you very much.